and we should be live. Let me check. Yes, we are live. Yay! As usual, we have one thumbs up. Constantly, someone from the announcement probably is giving us thumbs up. Wait a second. Wait, wait. Give me a second. We'll start recording. Uh, almost ready. I need to open my notes. That is extremely important. Close all the tabs. Okay. Three, two, one. Let's go. Hello, hello everyone. Welcome to the Non-Intuitive Beast Podcast brought to you by the Leaders Club that you are part two if you are listening to us. And you should still consider elevating your membership status by joining Discord channel that we are part of and even time to time looking into. And today in the virtual studio we have Dmitry Mananikov. Say hi to people. Happy Friday or Saturday, whatever you have now. Yes, uh, happy time of the day. Uh, and as usually the second voice you're hearing right now, the most annoying noise would be me, Slava Kovalevsky. I think we have this rule. We have someone who preparing the long topic and actually did prepare several topics, but we will start with something small. Uh, my friend, do you have anything interesting to share? Um, nope. Nope. Uh -huh. uh, I I only wanted to say several things before jumping on a bigger a bigger part. Uh, I actually ditched the Google Home in favor of Apple HomePods. Really? Yeah, my several Google Home died. <laughs> like the big one have okay. died, the small one have died, and like oh, I have to buy two of them now, and like why not to try something new? And uh, that's what. But that did, did you use uh, like a Google Assistant a lot for them? Yes, uh, for the very specific use cases: uh, alarm, switch on the lights, switch off the lights, mm. open, close the door, uh, set the timer, things like that. Uh, probably will be the same with Siri. Yeah, with Siri, it's fine. Like once you're trying to get something smarter, then sure, that's yeah. I I and to be fair, I do expect in a year or two all of them will have powerful LLMs behind, and that will improve. But sure, for now, it's uh, to be fair. The same was Google. It's not that it was not smarter. It was actually smarter than Siri. Smarter doesn't mean that it will work predictably well, and this is the biggest yeah. problem. Um, two minor surprises. Uh, actually, not the surprises, observations. One observation is uh, that obviously it's an Apple Apple hardware, so overpriced and really well done. Like especially the big port, it's uh, it's really well done. The sounds is amazing. But two things that I like less. One, I already can see that microphones are a little bit worse. So my Google Home Mini that were further from the source of the sound, uh, aka my mouse that's saying, hey, hey, hey Google. Mm -hmm. So the Google Mini was further and actually was working better in the sense of listening to Hey Google. But you probably know what's the proper solution for Apple users. Uh, buy another one? <laughs> yes. <laughs> sure, yes. <laughs> And, and goes without saying, yes, Siri is a little bit, little bit more stupid. I found interestingly interesting thing that even the Google Home app, in some of the cases, I like how it works a little bit more than mm -hmm. than uh, than the shortcuts. Um, I don't know. It just I'm not sure I like any shortcuts that much. In Google Home, there used to be an amazing feature where you are saying, uh, here is a word that I expect. Mm -hmm. And then you can use the plain sentences of subcommons. You can say, switch off the bedroom lights. And I don't have mm -hmm. to actually say, in this app, uh, do turn off this switch. Mm -hmm. You're just saying the vocal command that it needs to execute. Uh, it was a little bit simpler than, than the shortcuts and then connecting it with, with the CD. Mm -hmm. I, in some cases, I still have no clue how to do it. Like, I'm I, I still <laughs> learning it as I'm as I progressing. So, yeah. Um, 
Anyway, that's just a small observation. I have much bigger observation about ubiquity to share today, but this is the second big topic. The first one, I did the homework and I don't know how much we will even have time to go to the ubiquity uh, after this one. So mm -hmm. remember, I mentioned that I will rewatch the video. Okay. <laughs> I rewatched it. <laughs> yes, I finally rewatched it, and uh, uh, and uh, I'm ready to talk, so to speak. So there is a famous uh, famous guy, reasonably famous, judging by the amount of the subscribers, who has uh, got uh, famous recently because he is one of the people who creating contact uh, content specifically dedicated to men and their rights and many many different interesting aspects. And in one of his videos, he mentioned that uh, in a dating world, the time is on the man's side always. And many mm -hmm. people was asking what he meant, and he actually created the videos uh, about this specific aspect of how many uh, relationship might end from the women's perspective, where he outlined many interesting statistics and I wanted to discuss it with you because I really like how you're pointing and probing everything when I'm sharing it with you, like, oh, this looks like a bullshit. Uh, oh, this doesn't pass my sniffing test. Uh, I try to be prepared, mm -hmm. uh, but several things that uh, I want to say, he has so much information that I wouldn't be able to accurately uh, represent all of it. So in some cases I would be obviously defaulting. Let's assume that this is true. <laughs> and uh, okay. uh, but I will try to be as explicit as possible in those cases where I was saying, okay, I, I have no proof, but the guy look sound like he knows what he's doing. So, um, starting point that uh, he was making. Uh, and, and effectively why that uh, again as I mentioned time is on the uh, man's side and uh, he was describing statistically how everything could 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 end up for <laughs> the women and right now in the US there is a historical low numbers of marriages and overall people engaging of uh, dating uh, or uh, having a long-term relationship mm -hmm. but at the same time uh, this mostly been driven by the fact that childless women outperform childless men in almost all fields in the US. Salary wise. Uh, really? Yes, specifically childless. That's important. Yeah, I understand, but like, it's interesting because it was like for a long time it was like opposite. Like uh, women get less salaries, less things and so on. Correct. On average, this is still true. But okay. in many, many cases, the childless women in the longer run outperforming, start outperforming childless men. And again, mm -hmm. we speak about childless specific. Yeah, the moment yeah, you have a child, that's, it's a different story. Now, the interesting part that uh, since, um, and I'm, I'm, uh, since this theoretically should not be a problem in many, many cases, but the women are need time to build their expertise and build their career, which is absolutely mm -hmm. reasonable. So it takes time for them to, to get a bachelor's degree, to go to the job. But the same for men, right? Like everyone like, needs time to build career. Exactly, yes. Okay. Now we're taking to the we we arriving in very interesting things. Historically, uh, it's for some weird reason. I don't know why it's actually survived. The man being expected to make a proposition to a woman. Mm -hmm. This proposition could be, would you marry me? Let's go for a date. Let's have a long-term relationship. Almost in any interaction, it is expected that the man would do the proposition to a woman first. Okay. This is not necessarily, um, necessarily a law or anything. This is just how we wired. And it's reasonably expected to assume that this is true because yes, usually men do the first move in almost all phases of the relationship. Not the golden rule. There is many exceptions, okay. but statistically. Mm -hmm. Now, this doesn't look like a problem uh, when uh, the women specifically is, low, uh, is younger than 30 years old. In the 20 to 30 years, uh, the women can focus on themselves and they have a perception that they will have a huge amount of proposition 
that historically men are doing coming their way because when they're twenties, they mm-hmm. do indeed have many offers coming their way. So it feels mm-hmm. reasonable. Let me invest in myself because there is a tons amount of offers which probably will last. And here is the interesting thing that we will dive deeper. The sexual value of man starts speaking out after Soti. While the mm-hmm. value, market value of the women attractiveness it actually starts decreases after Soti. Mm-hmm. And there is many, many reasons uh, um, reason why. So what yeah, this means, I, mm-hmm. I a bit disagree with like that men's exactly like starting like increasing after 30. I would say it's not diminishing in the same pace. That I would say more. Um, not really. And the reason if you look again on the statistically what the most top answers when when people are asking, what do you searching in the partners? Mm-hmm. The man usually would say personality loyalty, fidelity, that you easy going and look. Mm-hmm. Both of the things are forms formed and peak in the young age. Yes. In 20 or 30. Then it starts degrade. Yes, sure. talk about women, right? Yes. When you ask yeah, women right. about men, mm-hmm. they would tell expertise, money, wisdom, assertiveness, being being sure in yourself. Now we okay, so we're not talking about sexual attraction attractiveness we're talking about attractiveness as a partner right so it's like a whole package to some extent but the reason why i'm so sexual because the women are actually considering that aspects there is a there is a uh, study there is many studies but one specific uh, that suggests that if the men will alter their appearance they the the most important thing that you can do if you want to look more attractive is to dye your hair in white because it's actually signals that you are the older man that you are mm. and uh, you still in the good health and this mm-hmm. is actually one of the main indicator of attractiveness that you are in that age with a good health you mm-hmm. probably have tons of the wisdom your genes are really good because you're in the good health being mm-hmm. being older okay. so so women do considering uh, consider older men more attractive than the younger men uh, mm-hmm. and this is again not a secret statistically women usually uh take partners who are older than they are and mm-hmm. this is that not is because of calculation for the marriage this is also because they are do considering them more attractive mm-hmm. so now here is an interesting and very simple thought if you are the man supposed to be doing an offer proposition for you this offer offer for example to tight your life whole life for the future in the marriage actually gets increasingly more costly as you earning more mm-hmm. but if the value on the other side decreasing after 20s it's increasingly hard for the woman to find the man would be willing to give this offer after she is sorted because from the man's side the cost of the offer going up and mm-hmm. the same time her attractiveness go down okay so there is several things how this can end for the women specifically five end games that statistically actually we can calculate how many women end up in in uh, which we which particular particular parts so outcome number one the women will keep pricing themselves high what i meant by this that again statistically women trying to find partners that are better than they are older mm-hmm. have more money so the women already invest in education already particular status see she will not be ready to settle on someone who is lower quality so to speak than she she needs an upper quality so this means that by definition she needs the man who is better than she are which mm-hmm. keeps the pool to a really, really small number, very small r- number. Mm-hmm. Uh, so roughly, if we speak about the 10% of the women, 1% of the men would qualify. So the outcome number one, the woman have a price tag high, but she actually beat the competition and end up having that man. Number mm-hmm. Outcome number two, the woman actually will lower the expectation Mm-hmm. and we'll be able to secure reasonably high value men by lowering the expectation okay uh now the third one obviously keeping price tag high 
uh, but still settling for the lower expectation. Mm -hmm. Finally, lower price tag and failing to secure anyone. Mm -hmm. Now, the interesting, uh, the interesting thing that uh, we have a two disproportionately uh, small and big group. We have a very small group of number one women that actually beating the market and securing the men that they actually want. And we have mm -hmm. a disproportionately big uh, number in the end. So statistically, 80% um, women who are childless are saying that they are not childless by uh, choice. 10% are childless because some physiological reasons. And only 10% are actually the women who are happy, who were bought into this uh, idea that they have more options in the future so they can be spending 20, 30 time of uh, educating, working, building career, and they still will have enough offers later on to, to, to come. Mm -hmm. And they are actually completely happy with where they end up. Now, 80% are unhappy because the dynamic have shifted and no one have uh, notified them up front that, you know, <laughs> this is the price that you'll pay. And out of this 80%, roughly 80%, so 80% of 80% is actually mm -hmm. women with education who have a career, who have a high education, mm -hmm. because they are the one that end up having a huge price tag and want to date up and the dating pool is very small. Mm -hmm. And then there is a two sort of, uh, of women out of everyone that we just described who has a high tag price, but settle for a low quality man. Okay. And this is actually the most common um, female who going to, to practitioners because they're usually very unhappy with their marriages. This is the source code of a lot of dysfunctional marriages because they settled for the sake of they wanted to have a partner. And there is this famous saying, why you your women is mad because you are not you are you are ain't her first choice because she mm. end up in relationship she wants but not with the man she wants i see and that is obviously makes <laughs> makes people crazy it's just it's it's uh but is it like mm -hmm. the same for men like is it like is for men as well like when they settle with the partners they didn't really like and then unhappy with this Correct. So we now looking specifically on the man, but the situation on the oh, sorry on the women, but situation on the man a little bit opposite. opposite. So mm -hmm. in the sense that if the man is uh, uh, divorcing later on, his mm -hmm. options actually extremely high. He mm -hmm. have an offer that he can keep giving to a younger woman, and that offer right now actually priced by a lot. Sure. Yeah, but then mm -hmm. like as a trick, right? Like. They can get uh, women with uh, like younger and uh, like pretty like everything goes with that. But he also can make get a women who are actually just looking for him as a money part and not a partner part. Correct. We're only speaking about the fact that he has way more options. Mm. Uh, and out of these options is a due diligence to, to find the one that you want. Mm -hmm. While if you are on the other side, women who is in the divorce later on in age, you have way less options. There is many, mm -hmm. many women who has zero options, in fact. Mm -hmm. uh, and it doesn't matter at that point how lower you will you will lower your price tag because the options just not there. You don't have enough uh, uh, people are making the offer. And the feminists usually will tell you this is because men are intimidated smart women is actually statistically not true because uh, as women start being more and more uh, educated and going to, to the different jobs, uh, this have not changed the statistically the fact that usually men do propositions and do the offers to a younger women. Mm -hmm. That have not changed. The, 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 w with the movement of uh, women being more educated, the percentage did not go down. If you're saying mm -hmm. that, oh, the men just intimidated smart women with a growing amount of smart women, you should see this percentage going down, but it did not. It was exactly mm -hmm. the same percentage. So men are just men. <laughs> that's, that's effectively effectively the conclusion. Now, so the truth here is that for many, many women, there will be no better chance to securing the best man in the relationship they want than today. Like that's literally today they have the highest chances. Um, 
Yes, I. Uh, there, there is actually one way out. You know, this there is one way out. If you're on the other side, is to start making the propositions, start making the offers. If you're mm -hmm. waiting, the offers come your way. You actually can start rigging the system by making the offers and lowering your price tag. These two things together actually can easily uh, easily help you. In the same way, you know, this guy is actually comparing a man with a bag. You know, he, uh, if you don't have money for a Gucci bag you can buy a cheaper bag. Now the question, can you mentally adjust yourself and be as happy with a cheaper bag as you would be with a Gucci? That's actually the biggest problem. If not, you you are in the relationship you want, you have a bag, but with a man you don't want. It's a cheap bag, it's not the Gucci. Um, Anyway, that's uh, that's uh, that's the, the gist of the video. Man, man uh, bags. Man and bags, yes, yes. Uh, but the whole message there was, uh, he was doing this message in the context of another video where he was suggesting for the men who were part of the very toxic relationship who end up finally escaping them, his message was time is on your side. It might look like you, you lost a lot of time, but for the man, it's actually might be beneficial in the long run and then rebuild the family. He has a lot of chances. So it's more or less was content specifically focusing on that type group, mm -hmm. at least to extend that I understood, to calm it's them actually down. actually important context because from this context, it means like is um, makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and um, yeah. Uh, but yeah, inverted dynamic. I would love to hear someone doing the inverted dynamic statistic because again, we just saying that a lot of changes between 30s to 40s plus, but at the same time, a lot of changing from 10 to, to 30s, like in this time frame where people start exploring social dynamics and just, just interaction with opposite mm -hmm. gender in different, different ways. Anyway. And dynamic for after 60. <laughs> and dynamic after 60, yes, yes, yes. There was a really cool uh, TV show. Um, I can't forget, like, it's like about two old guys. One is like super old, another one like, Somehow, old. Kaminsky, Method Kaminsky. Yes, that one. It was like <laughs> fun exploration. Also, on the same topic in some ways. Uh, true, actually, yes, Kaminsky Method. It's an amazing TV series that have a nice, uh, you know, each episode like a painting, mm. but it's lack lacking a plot. Oh yeah, there's like <laughs> nothing happening. It's like situational. Yes. Um, you know, this note, since we're just uh, speaking about this, Amazon uh, Fallout got released. Uh, okay, did you watch it? I will be watching right after this show, the first episode, yes. Uh, okay, will tell me good or not. Let's go in IMDb. IMDb, my friend, we already have the first episode out. Okay, 8.7, that's good. 8.7, whoa, uh, wait, but this is like the whole, I would assume it consistent with the first episode, yes, look, uh, wait, what? Uh, Episodes. Oh, they already scored each episode. Yeah, it's good. They are all more than eight. Man, they are good. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> maybe, maybe it's like a year of good TV shows. I don't know. Like three body problems. I, I'm watching uh, Shogun, Shogun right now, and like I really like it. It's like a bit slow paced, but they good like did a good setup of like what's going on. Like um, I'm curious to see it. Yeah, that's that's on my uh, my to do list as well. Uh, yeah, that's on my to do list as well. Okay, uh, second big topic for today. Uh, I finally uh, pre-configured my proper network. Thanks to you, my friend uh, Dimitri over here was uh, raising the bar in terms of home <laughs> networks for for years now. Uh, I was quietly admiring and wanted to build something myself similar and. Um, I don't. Oh yeah, I remember what. Um, so I have a problem at home. So what motivated me finally? So in my home, uh, Xfinity router that my provider gives me actually covers everything with reasonable network mm -hmm. except Wi-Fi 2.4 uh, mm -hmm. in in the, in the old Wi-Fi 2.4 gigahertz. Mm -hmm. So the alternatives, obviously, you you wait. Was it like there's no 2.4? or It was low coverage. Uh, sorry, here is what gave me pause. There was coverage reasonably well. There was 2.4. Okay. It was working horribly. Like at some point, the devices mm. connected to 2.4 just would disappear. 
and then would not reconnect. They would not see. But then when, mm-hmm. when they do connect, they will indicate that the connection is strong. So they mm-hmm. see it. It was horribly and strange. And since, since a lot of stuff like simple safe using 2.4, IoT mm-hmm. devices, it was a nightmare, so to speak. Now, a friend of mine gave me a TP link. Okay. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I connected TP link. It was working well. It was high end TP link. Mm-hmm. I look on the OS of TP-Link and configuration and realize that it has nothing. Like, it has nothing. Uh, the, you can forget about VLAN proper support. Mm-hmm. And realize that if I'm going to actually accept this TP-Link, <laughs> it's support 2.4 gigahertz fine enough. And, um, and it was not exactly a gift. Uh, it was, uh, you, you know, I probably will have to, to, to pay back at least portion of that mm-hmm. TP-Link because it, he was intended to sell it and I just well, mm-hmm. needed something right now. So since I'm going to buy anyway, why not to finally buy something proper? Yeah, I think like router is actually one of the most important devices at home because it's pretty much guards your internal internet, like internal network. And like everything else you can replace, you can change, you don't really care about quality, but this one like needs to be a good one. And maybe not even router, like it, whatever is your gateway to the outer world. I agree with you. I could not agree more. Uh, that's, that's yes. And uh, so far, these things is amazing. By the way, it's really hard to buy it. It's really sold out constantly. Uh, I had to... Pretty popular. Yeah, but I, I actually have to overpay plus twenty dollars to buy it on Amazon from resellers. Like I end up <laughs> just yeah, it's uh, so this is an amazing. It has uh, four LANs. Uh, l- it has proper VLAN. So it, I just don't want to 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 say what else it supports. I will try to go directly to my impressions. What I really like. Um, so super nice features that I start using out of the box. First of all, really nice UI. I. Mm-hmm. I it, it's really nice, nicely well done. It has a lot of things working out of the box. For example, you can say, oh, I don't want any ever any incoming connections from China and Russia. Like you just literally mm-hmm. picking countries uh, on the map. Uh, it has a hotspot mode. So we literally can enable guest Wi-Fi with hotspot mode that will enable a login page, uh, you know, like mm-hmm. in hotels where there will be mm-hmm. login. So you can do that if you want. Um, out of the box ad blockers on the traffic level you specify mm-hmm. i don't want to do ads and honestly i have no clue how they're doing because they are supporting third-party dns so it should be somewhere somehow different i don't know how maybe uh they sniffing dns unix type firewall if you know unix type firewall they have a very simple setup and very and, and uh, literally access to all the firewall mm-hmm. rules vlans all the way doesn't matter how many uh, everything you need is supported vpn out of the box i actually don't need them because i what, use, mm-hmm. what type of vpn does it support uh they have four uh l2tp uh open vpn uh, wireguard wireguard and the first one vfi man this is their own horrible shit that they shouldn't have ever mm-hmm. built but you really care about wireguard i'm, I'm still waiting uh, when wireguard will be added to peplink routers they promise in the next firmware so maybe in some future but you have synology why do you need like i using synology as vpn why do you need that uh, i will say because i don't trust myself I don't trust myself that I will enable proper networking between all devices to make it work correctly and not to expose like everything. That's pretty much my main concern right now. Because I don't I don't have a maybe like in one day I'll spend some time understanding, but right now I don't understand like how VPN packets are going here and there and how like internal IP addresses works like in my network. Like if someone goes like through this VPN and it's output on Synology. Uh, will it be will it have access to other devices or not like things like this i still like i i wanted to understand but i never have time to to really go through it so i want like router like to deal with it but uh what i what i don't understand still so on the router you're enabling vpn on synology you're also enabling vpn what's the difference like why the fact that your probably container that is running on synology is different from probably container that will be running on router because i have a good understanding how router work and how networking work in that case and plus i understand how rules on like on uh, router works 
Uh, maybe, maybe you're right. Maybe I should just like, you know, like that, try to use it on Synology and see how it like deals with IPs. Again, I just like never actually spend time working on it. And I also never had like, I want to use WireGuard instead of OpenVPN, but it's not like a big problem. OpenVPN still works for me. I'm using L2TP uh, just so it's everywhere enabled. Um, okay. So the strange part. So this is everything amazing what I, what I, what I loved and uh, strange part. Remote access by default. It's obviously exactly what you told me. Uh, so, you know, I opening the app. App is amazing. Setting everything up. Then I go on the street. I'm opening up and I see it have everything access works. to it. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> We're like, wait a second. <laughs> what? <laughs> Man, even more funnier thing. They have a quote unquote VPN. VPN. Sure, it's VPN, but it's hard, it's going through the third party servers because how in order to set it up they need to pierce your your net so in order to pierce your net they literally having connection from one side to their cloud and from your phone mm -hmm. to their cloud and they call it vpn <laughs> it's it's slow uh it's very slow comparing to my vpn on synology and it's unsafe it's man in the middle that i don't want to be there uh, yeah it's a bit strange usually like like things like tail scales they just use like sort party service to to do holes and then you connect like directly Strange that they need to like uh, proxy everything. Oh, um, sorry. Uh, I don't know they proxy everything. I have no mm -hmm. clue. The moment because I don't want them to poke hole even that. I do not yeah. want them to do any shit on my behalf because it's easily allows them to introduce men in the middle. Yeah, but I think it's more like as like consumer device, right? Like as a consumer device, you don't want people like to try to understand. Oh, do they have public IP? Is it changing? They just sound like I have it working. So that's probably the reason. Um, I found like oh, Peblink has a VPN service, uh -huh. but it's used for quite interesting thing. It's actually not supposed to be like the, the service they offer. It's not really about you like connecting to your home. It's so interesting. So it's for businesses uh -huh. that have multiple ones, you know, like as a resilience, uh -huh. but they're very like, they pretty much like they need to balance their like traffic as well, but also they don't want to lose connection whenever something happens with one one for example if you like have a you know talking with me and your connection goes through one line and this line goes down oh it will take a connect so they have vpn which actually like goes through traffic like like keeps connection regardless of which one's used right now so we're talking one cable is down like it's immediately sends another one and connection stays the same and apparently it's like pretty like um popular service Interesting. And uh, yeah, I uh, I remember Google Cloud has VPN service and mm -hmm. by default now it's redundant VPN. It's exactly what you mentioned. Two channels separately. Then on your site, you can physically mm -hmm. even separate them. But the Google will give you two endpoint for exactly that reason. Um, speaking of the traffic, one thing that I did not like. Uh, oh, by the way, for the remote access, uh, the good thing is just easily to switch it off. So there is one checkbox, you're switching it off, done. It works exactly as it's supposed to, so no more bullshit. Uh, so that part is there. Uh, <laughs> Until some programmer forgot to. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> sure, yes. <laughs> yes, uh, that is there. Um, now, connectivity one, this one disappointment that they have so far. There is no very nice full traffic analyzer. So what do I mean by this? I want to see where my Philips Hue actually went. And it's only... But, uh -huh. Okay. So it doesn't like doesn't give you like IP addresses or you want like man in the middle, like everything? I just want to see when it, when it's, where exactly it connects. And uh, I want to see the exact IP addresses and what it's doing right now, it's aggregated by its own logic. So for example, I can see that mm -hmm. Xbox talking to Netflix, they aggregated all the domain names and IP addresses that they know about Netflix. So this kind of simplify things because you can go to and say, Xbox, I want to enable access to <laughs> Netflix, Amazon Prime and Microsoft you only. see like a particular IP. Exactly. So like Philips Hue going to uh, SSL on top of TCP. Whatever is there. Yeah, whatever is that. So he, he, they can be talking to 12 or 30 different providers and uh, doing some shit. Um, mm -hmm. 
And there is a workaround. You can actually SSH on the router. It gives you SSH. And on the router, you can uh, syslog and you can start dumping whatever you want. You can install mm -hmm. the Unix, anything. But, you know, I would love... Yeah, strange is they don't have it in interface. Like. Yeah. My guess is because uh, this probably will increase two, two things. First of all, it is some load on the CPU to, to do additional parsing and show it to you. And B, you probably want this to be logged and it's tons of the information. So you mm -hmm. will need to have a storage. Uh, but def by default, they don't even put SD card uh, with these things. Uh, so, mm. so I found nice on my router, like you can set a syslog server and just dump. So it like goes to Synology, like everything, if I want to parse it later. That's what I want to do. You SSH to it and you configure an ACS lock in any way you want. But, you know, mm -hmm. it would be nice to have it in UI. So I don't have to SSH mm -hmm. and actually okay time and pre-configure this shit. Makes sense. Um, what else from things that I did not like much? 5 gigahertz actually a little bit worse than my Xfinity, uh, which is to some extent expected. Mm -hmm. uh, no way 5.7. Like, that's, that's sad, but... Yeah. But why do you need it? Like for future? Yeah, just for future, because uh, this is a problem when you're buying all in one devices. Five years from yeah. now, you still would want the same firewall, but you wanted the Wi Fi 7 Plus, and here it doesn't have. Theoretically, you can use Mesh, you can add other devices, but it's, you know, this aftertaste is there now. Yeah, yeah. I also have this like conclusion that like I would better, like in the future, buy like a separate devices. So, like you can switch them, upgrade them, move them. It's much easier. Yeah, I probably will follow in my next move to a new home. <laughs> I probably will, will do exactly the same. I have a friend who is living on also Potrero and he actually did it in a nice way. He has a, a full server rock and he has a dream machine with a rock, Synology for the rock and mm -hmm. proper networking. That's just amazing. But, you know, uh, I'm not ready <laughs> just yet. Money wise, I'm not ready just yet. But also it takes time to set up the things. I mean, it's a fun thing to do, but it's also a kind of hobby or time investment. Yep, yep, 100%. Last thing I want to mention is just how the things uh, Dream Router looks. It looks like an Apple device. It's It, it has this small, tiny screen in front, which is actually a monitor. Do you remember Apps, Apple Time Capsules? They actually had a really cool, cool router back then. I owned I one. Cool. Time capsule, yes, yes. Oh, wait. Router. So, no, not the time capsule, actual router. They had, like, I think they had router, like, long time ago. I think you're right. But Apple. time capsule was router, no? Uh, time capsule, uh, yes, Airport Express, yes. Airport, yes. Airport Express, yes. You could have yeah, used... It's a, it's a small one, but they also had, like, a big one, like a tower. Airport time capsule. No, oh, time, time capsule is airport plus time capsule. It's effectively, it's not, a, uh, the main use case was not the, to be a router. Yeah, but like it was looking pretty cool. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I actually had one of that. Uh, and then I remember I was wanting to sell it. So I, it has a special mod because it's hard drive inside. You know like how they doing mm -hmm. rewrite five or seven times to make sure that it's absolutely impossible to restore it. And it took it, I think, three days <laughs> to do the, the, the secure wipe out of itself before it was able, I was able to resell it. But mm -hmm. anyway, uh, man, good old times, <laughs> good old times. Um, Okay, this actually was my two main big topics that I wanted to to share with you. I'm still building my topology of the network. It still will take some time. You know, I found two things irritating. One, a lot of the stuff doesn't work without the internet and you kind of finding yourself in this position, whether I want to break it completely or 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 uh, or what? Like, what do I do with this? Um, I think like it's usually with IT device, the one thing uh, you technically can do is to limit their expose at least to other VLANs, uh, like avoid inter VLAN connections. They still technically can go like on L2 level and like talk to other devices, but if none of them has access to internet, it's not that bad. <laughs> um, yeah, but and like I usually dedicatedly open like a particular IPs, but it's, it's, it's annoying, like for some of the things. 
Um, and that is like even worse. Like for example, I, I purchased a couple of the Sakara Aquara devices, like a presence sensor. They work very well. And initially the problem was like to set up them, you need an app, you need access to internet. So then you set up like zones on these tools. Then you can turn off internet and they appear in a home kit as like a sample triggers for one for each zone. Mm-hmm. Recently, I wanted to change zone for one of them and application says you need to log in now. So now I have to go like through login, like to connect, it's like super annoying. Apparently I'm not the only one, I found like some guys, they actually started to make their own devices like this and they start selling them. They look a bit more uglier, like, mm-hmm. but pretty much they use the same sensor and like super simple firmware, like open source, like everything, like please use it. Man. Uh... So far, the most annoying story I have with the Philips Hue. So I don't know, I have several VLANs now and my main VLAN can talk to any uh, devices in IoT VLAN. Mm -hmm. But devices in VLAN from IoT cannot directly talk to to, to back, so to speak. Mm -hmm. If they want to initiate and talk to my phone, they cannot. And everything works fine, except Philips Hue. I have no idea what they're doing, but if you directly put the IP address Unless you actually on the same VPC, on the same VLAN, mm-hmm. uh, it will say that I don't see it. Mm, so it doesn't, it can go cross, cross VLAN, interesting. You can ping the IP address, but it, it tell no, I don't see it <laughs> in the app. I have no clue what they're doing, how they're doing, but they're doing really super cheap. Yeah, it's strange. Um, I, I, I have a couple of Philips Hue devices, just like leftovers, like light strips. Um, but I essentially just connected them to HomeKit through HomeBridge, I think, and I don't ever use Home like their applications or whatever. HomeBridge, remind me, is this 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 one? So yeah, HomeBridge essentially it's uh, tools that you can run to connect devices that are not supported by HomeKit to HomeKit because I use HomeKit for everything, um, and this is just like a essentially a bridge. Um, it's not like a perfect, uh, but it works for most of my devices that like I usually I bought before, which were not compatible with HomeKit. Um, but I'm still on, not not following. Uh, for you, you, Philips Hue do is supported by HomeKit. Um, Philips Hue, maybe it's supported now, but it wasn't supported. There was some ah, issues, so I mean, I but. Yeah, I think I just use most through through this tool. But maybe you're right. Maybe I use Philips Hue Direct. I don't remember. Oh yeah, they have Hue and Homebridge, so maybe you pro- expose Apple Kit uh, Hue compatible devices. Yeah, uh, I'm trying to remember why I like use why it's yeah whatever. Like I use this thing, <laughs> it, it somehow works. I want to try Home Assistant, but I don't really like one thing that keeps me on a Home Kit is this like automation which works like when everyone left home. You mm-hmm. can do something and when first person came and that's very reliable because apple knows where you are you have like apple watch you have iphones and actually very good at tracking like people in and out um and every other way is not reliable you know like oh uh, how to track wi-fi if i go walking and my phone at home it doesn't mean i'm at home right like i'm still walking i have my apple watch with me but otherwise i would switch probably to home assistant like as a separate system yeah, I, I I am absolutely okay to use third party assistant so far mm-hmm. in the Google or Siri. That's that's not a problem. But having all everything connected locally, I probably will give up. I I don't think I will ever have everything locally connected. Hue now also requires you to exactly as you mentioned. They actually now requiring you to have a, a account. The, the, they slowly pushing you there. Yeah, it's actually like uh, it's pretty annoying um, for these devices to do it and. Uh, I really appreciate like some companies like if they they make really good devices okay it's matter it's like local like it works well i really hope there will be some companies that will advertise it you know like okay we're making devices they cost a lot but they very local. like you don't need app you don't need anything it just works <laughs> um but not not yet yeah yeah that's definitely would be would be something to look forward to um Anyway, on that front, on that front, I don't remember how I end up here. Oh yes, I was speaking about the network uh, network problem, especially with Philip Huey. Still trying to figure out what to do there, what the firewall rules, and uh, yeah. 
Anyway, uh, let's go to last set of the topics. We're actually coming back to one hour and there is two things. One I see you brought up that we have not touched on, which is Suno. And then one topic that I wanted to chat with, but first. Yeah, uh, Suno.com, it's a website for generating music. And when I first hear about it like a week ago on Twitter, I was like, okay, one more music generation. You know, like it was before, like I think, Five years ago, even more, I, there was a website where you can open it and they pretty much play some simple electronic music nonstop. They use like different patterns. It was always mm -hmm. changing, but like pretty much the same. And like during years, people created like music generation like tools. And they were always like outputting like some kind of electronics or something very simple. This one is a moment of, for me, it was okay. I, from like a person who was not believing in music can be generated, you know, like in a good way without humans, it completely changed my mind. Because once you listen to a few of these songs, like different genres, like with run, like they have vocal, which can be like chorus vocal, female, male, like all kinds of styles. They have all kinds of styles. You want rap, you want blues, you want like metal, you want death metal. And it sounds really good. Like, if I would hear this on radio when I'm driving and someone asked, oh, do you think it's AI or human? I would say, like, of course it's humans. Like, I don't know, like, it's like <laughs> why, why would say it's a, it's really, really changing the game. Apparently once they soon release their like uh, uh, product, there are, I think mo two more companies pops up because it's like, okay, now it's no, no one can hide it. It's like, it's a new run. It's the same as was with ChatGPT for questioning and information. This one is for music. Um, for video, we still yet to see, you know, something like, okay, this is really indistinguishable. But for music, this one, like, again, if you have probably really good music hearing and like you into music, it would, you may understand that's AI, but for me, like, no, like for me, like all this music, like seems very legit. So I have an interesting like theory or like, um, Oh, uh, all this, uh, do you mind? Let's spend a moment try to play for our listener something here. I can we do it? Uh, let's see. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. So that was fully generated. Exactly. Uh, there was actually someone putting stack traces from a <laughs> Swift program panic <laughs> and it was sound amazing you know <laughs> if i would just like listen somewhere like without like trying to get words especially it's like english uh -huh. like i wouldn't realize that they literally song like a stack trace like from program <laughs> it was so good yeah so people start doing a lot of like getting some stupid uh, wording like from chat gpt or even from like any random you know like i've seen linux uh, startup manual like oh yes <laughs> song, <laughs> um yeah, and like I really encourage people like who listen to us like to go into this Suno S U N O dot com and just to to try a few songs because for me it's like really really next step of things. And the topic I wanted to talk about and we have a few minutes is about freezing art. Essentially, over like human lifetime, like artists created new genres. Like when genres like became obsolete, everyone was told they created a new one, start like experimenting. Because technically it's where money is, right? Like you're going to new one, like people appreciate it more. Um, because during like, I don't know, like 18th, 19th century, like you won't, uh, you won't impress anyone with one more forest picture, right? Like there was a thousands of them. And with music, right? Like 20th, 20th century was pretty much golden age. Like we have really huge implosion of different genders, like, like, like from metal, rock, like rap, like all kind of reggae, like electronics like complete like like huge explosion mm -hmm. in 21st centuries continued like a uh, sub genres like some new genres happy like dubstep for example right but we have like, a lot of new genres because m musicians artists they actually created something new they try to like go like out uh, and they have money they had money for that because they they created new songs like with old genre for example and people pay for that they can create new one now when AI generated, like, okay, now a lot of labels or radios, they can start generating this music. Spotify can, instead of like paying people, run multiple channels with completely generated music and no one actually will notice. But this, all this music, it's, it's created from samples of all previous music. 
So now whatever you create with this one will probably give you one of previous genres. It will not give you like something completely new, maybe. And new musicians like who or like existing mu musicians, they will not won't have like as much money to experiment with new genres. And AI won't won't learn this new genre. So we're kind of stuck with all, <laughs> all styles we had before. Um, and we just continue to live with them. And the question, is it actually true or it's it's not? I so here is what gave me pause. I don't say I, I don't think that we will stuck because uh, neural network replicates uh, replicates the brain and this is how all we also do things we're trying to replicate past things and then we mm -hmm. end up creating something new so the neural network will be creating something new uh, in terms of genres in terms of other things uh, the thing is that they will be creating outliers. Uh, mm -hmm. in a particular genre that eventually people might start calling some genres, uh, new mm -hmm. genres, so to speak. The bigger problem, because music is actually a simpler use case. What I mean by that, that music can invent new genre within itself. So you can mm -hmm. have a neural network that generates something and finding a new genre. The good example would be um, a game of chess or game of Go, where a neural network already inventing new moves and mm -hmm. the new styles that was not created before. Where it's getting interesting is when, uh, how you will invent a new paradigm of programming if neural network not creating yet programming languages. So you need to supply the SDK and documentation. Someone need to write docs about the new language in order for the neural network to understand how to use it and design the new way of programming with it. But maybe we, like, if we talk about programming, maybe we won't do new languages. Instead, like, you know, like, connect neural network to all our APIs around and tell it what to do. And it will do it for you. It's same like with music, though, like, neural network doesn't really know about anything about, like, uh, music um, theory, like, underlying, like, instruments. It's just, like, output something that you've seen before. Uh, yes, what I... Oh. Sorry. <laughs> That's a stupid one. But I, I guess I'm trying to say that we are very close to the point where you might not theoretically need musician because you will be creating music, but in the programming you still have tons of the people that will be writing description for the new SDK they're releasing that will be consumable by neural network. Maybe, yeah. Uh, um, mm -hmm. I had another like thought, but I completely forgot about it. But nah, I was like, it would be actually interesting to see. Maybe it will pop up actually new. Um, I was like new profession, you know, like music artist whose job to create new styles for a neural network. You know, like they will use instruments, they will use previous samples, they will combine something, and they will teach neural network to start doing this style. Imagine producer who is not operating on human band. But instead of creating a new few AIs, trying like to teach them in a new particular style or type of songs, and then like make them play new songs. Songs. Oh, I'm pretty sure you, you're right. Similar how you know. Uh, I hope you would agree that AI will not yet replace programmers, but the programmers that do use UI will replace programmers that do not use. So musician might be in the same boat. The musician that will be using UI and effectively will switch their job from actually playing instrument to be a prompt engineers will probably mm -hmm. will replace musicians that still do play instruments. Yeah, probably. Um, on that note, since we're almost at hour, I want to mention that there is so many uh, new services like, like Suno, uh, just to name several that popped up recently. And Suno is still the best. Uh, Udio. Udio, same. Uh, pick the genre, pick the music, fully generated. And they all trying to tackle different aspects in the sense that Suno historically was focusing on everything. All languages plus lyrics plus music. And the services that are popping up doing something one but much better. So mm -hmm. one of them doing only music, one of them doing only vocal, one of them doing only particular genre. Um, and yeah, Sonato. <laughs> and now and then, next someone created a startup <laughs> <laughs> by using few APIs to combine a song. Yeah, yeah, and we'll be reselling with 300% premium the services to musicians. <laughs> yes. 
<laughs> oh man, yeah, this is so true. This is how the world works. Okay, my friend, I would suggest we end here. Uh, yeah, any it's a good time. Yeah, it's, it was exactly, not exactly, almost exactly one hour. Uh, anything you want to say to our listeners? Uh, how many? 32 listeners. Ooh, it's uh, nice to know people actually listen to us. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, thanks everyone that you're listening. It's actually give a good boost to, to continue. Same here. I think. Uh, okay. Yeah, thank you, my friend. And thank you, everyone who listens to us. Have an amazing rest of the week. And we will talk to you same place, same time next week. Bye bye. Bye bye. Okay, one second, let me stop the live.